Everyone take a seat. We're under the pressure of votes. They're going to happen sometime uh, around 4, 4.15, so we're going to try to make certain we get through everybody's statements and maybe uh, some initial uh, comments. So beginning with my opening comments, the subcommittee meets today to receive an update on how the departments of the Navy and the Air Force are addressing physiological episodes in tactical and training aircraft. I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel of wet witnesses. We have Mr. Craig, Mr. Clint, Craig, is that correct? Okay, <clears throat> Principal Engineer from the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, Rear Admiral Sarah Joyner, Physiological Episodes Action Team Lead for the U.S. Navy, and Lieutenant General Mark Nolan, Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. I want to thank each of you for your service and for your important testimony today. For over two years now, this subcommittee has held briefings, hearings, and conducted site visits regarding the occurrences of physiological episodes, or PEs, in tactical and training aircraft. As I stated before, I believe Navy leadership was initially slow to respond to this issue that is having a direct effect on overall readiness and affecting the confidence of our pilots as well as their ability to perform their missions. Because it's not just these, that these events are occurring, it's also the anxiety that these events occur in succession. As a result of the subcommittee's activity, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2017 included legislation that required an independent report of the Navy's efforts to resolve these issues. That report was delivered to the subcommittee in mid-December and a copy has been provided to members' offices. According to the report, <clears throat> the Navy was addressing the PE problem as an aircraft problem, not a human problem. We have to acknowledge that physiological episodes happen to people, not aircraft. I was just talking to the Secretary of the Air Force and the human body as a sensor is perhaps different than just our technological sensors and can give us a gap in the information or data that we're receiving, but we have to trust those uh, those pilots, those human uh, responses and reports that we're having of these issues. The report also concludes that the FA-18 <clears throat> systems that support human health are complex, dynamic, and interactive. As a result, the more complex, dynamic, and interactive a system is, the more important it is to have a well-coordinated systems approach to design and operations. Finally, the report notes that the physiological episodes will persist in the FA-18 <clears throat> and all high-performance aircraft if there is a piecemeal approach to human systems integration. Our witness, Mr. Craig, was the primary author of this report, and he's prepared to provide the subcommittee with a summary of the report's findings and recommendations. On September 15th of last year, Ms. Zongas and I vis visited the Naval Air Station Pax River to receive briefings on the root cause and corrective action processes from members of the Navy's Physiological Episodes Action Team. We spoke with engineers and pilots and learned about the Navy's process to find the root cause of these events. We were also briefed on the Navy's attempts to alert and protect the air crew and monitor the system. Additionally, we spoke with engineers at some of the labs who are analyzing specific portions of the primary systems that make up the Environmental Control System, ECS, and the onboard Oxygen Generating System, OBOGS. I believe the Navy has taken a step in the right direction by establishing a formal action team directly responsible for addressing physiological episodes. The team is led by our Navy witness today, Rear Admiral Joyner. However, despite these efforts, pilots are continuing to experience physiological episodes, and I'm concerned about the increased frequency. For example, since the subcommittee's last event in May of last year, the Navy as well as the Air Force have continued to report incidences of PE in aircraft. This past summer, the Navy made the decision to ground T-45 training aircraft due to increasing occurrences of pilots experiencing hypoxia symptoms in the aircraft. The decision was made after a significant number of instructor pilots at all three T-45 training locations refused to fly the aircraft due to safety concerns with oxygen systems. It's an incident that we were very concerned about in this committee that would have to go to the level of the pilots themselves intervening and refusing to fly uh, prior to leadership understanding the need to intervene. The Air Force grounded F-35 Joint Strike Fighters at Luke Air Force Base in June of last year due to oxygen problems. The F-35 fleet has experienced 29 physiological episodes to date. In early December of last year, the subcommittee was informed that 13 A-10 aircraft at Davis Monthan Air Force Base have been grounded due to problems with the oxygen systems. And just last week, the Air Force grounded all T-6 training aircraft at six operating locations due to an increasing rate of unexplained physiological episodes in the T-6 aircraft. There is no doubt this remains a complex problem to solve that requires a well-coordinated systems approach to include all factors such as the aircraft, the pilot, and the environment. 
So in closing, we need to be reassured that this remains a top priority for the Navy and the Air Force and that the two services are coordinating efforts and that such a systems approach to solve this problem is being taken. The increasing frequency of these physiological episodes is having a direct effect on overall readiness. And as such, we expect to receive your professional assessment on what we as members of this subcommittee can do to help you address this critical problem. In addition to effects on readiness, this has a direct correlation and effect on morale. Before we begin with witnesses' opening statements, I'd like to turn to my good friend from Massachusetts, Ms. Nikki Songus, for any comments that she may want to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to our witnesses. It's good to have you here. And I want to thank Chairman Turner for holding this hearing and continuing the subcommittee's focus on this really important issue. One of the reasons for today's hearing is the completion of the independent review of the Navy's efforts to address persistently high rates of physiological episodes experienced by aviators in FA-18 aircraft, a critical issue since this, these episodes can put a pilot's life at risk. The review was mandated by the fiscal year NDA, 17 NDAA and conducted by the NASA Engineering and Safety Center under the leadership of Mr. Clinton Craig, who is here with us today. And I'd like to thank you, Mr. Craig, and your entire team for your diligent work on the report. I'm also pleased that Rear Admiral Joyner is with us today, but I must point out that the Navy has to decide, decided to move the Admiral out of her current position overseeing the service's response to physiological episodes after less than a year in the position. While I understand that the Navy is working to find another talented officer to take over the position, I do believe that making the change so soon sends an unfortunate message to the entire Navy, 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 Navy aviation community, including their families. This important issue deserves unified leadership, and I'd urge Navy leadership to prioritize continuity in this position moving forward. After, view, after reviewing the report, it appears its findings and recommendations fall into three broad categories. First, it makes several findings and recommendations related to the, quote, human factors, unquote, underlying the Navy's physiological episode problem. The report states up front that, quote, physiological episodes happen to people, not aircraft, unquote. It goes on to point out numerous areas where human factors research, data gathering, and testing is needed to provide a true end-to-end -end understanding of the problem. I'll have several questions on some of the issues raised in the report in this area. Second, the report points out several specific concerns with the design and specifications of the F-A-18 aircraft related to aircrew life support. It places particular attention on the aircraft's oxygen generation and cabin pressure systems, raising significant questions regarding both. Finally, the report examines internal Navy organizational challenges that may be making it much harder to address the PE issue. In particular, the report focuses attention on the need for the Navy's medical community to be more tied into the Navy's ongoing lines of effort. And of special concern to me, given what we learned about the situation the Navy faced this summer in its T-45 training community, the report also raises concerns about, quote, a breakdown of trust in leadership within the pilot community, unquote, regarding the Navy's efforts on this issue. I know that hundreds of dedicated people in the Navy are working very hard to address this problem, but the report points out that we have a long way to go and that in some areas we can do much, much better. I am hopeful that the Navy is carefully examining the findings of this report and acting on them as quickly as possible and hope to learn more on this front today. The other reason for today's hearing is to get an update from the Air Force on its challenges with its own physiological episodes, most recently in F-35A, A-10s, and T-6A aircraft fleets. In the case of the T-6A, the Air Force's fleet remains grounded. We need to know the full story of what happened and how the Air Force plans to stay ahead of this problem moving forward. I look forward to today's testimony and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Sockins. Without objection, all our witnesses' prepared statements will be included in the hearing record. Mr. Craig will begin, followed by Admiral Joyner and General Noland. Mr. Craig. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Turner, Ranking Member Tsongas, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the NASA Engineering and Safety Centers, or NESC's, independent assessment 
of the Navy's efforts to understand and mitigate the F-18 fleet physiological. I'm sorry, sir, if I could run for a second, if you could move that microphone to in front of you, because it, 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 we're not hearing, or just direct, they are directional, if you could point it at you. There you go, thank you. Too complicated for me. Um, <clears throat> I'm honored to be serving as the lead for this NESC team. The NAC performs an independent testing analysis and assessments to help address some of NASA's tougher challenges. We can draw upon technical experts from all 10 NASA centers, from industry, from academia, and other governmental agencies. This allows us to bring the country's best experts to bear on the problems and challenges of NASA programs. In February 2017, the U.S. Navy's Naval Air Systems Command requested NASA's assistance in assessing the Navy's efforts to understand the causes of physiological episodes affecting air crew on their F-18 fleet. In March of 2017, the NESC assembled a multidisciplinary team with a broad range of expertise that included flight surgeons, life support system experts, engineers, and several subject matter experts. In the course of this investigation, the team reviewed data from a variety of sources, uh, visited multiple manufacturing sites and Navy commands, and held no uh, numerous discussions with knowledgeable personnel. The NESC's team findings and recommendations are based on this data and not an exhaustive review of all F-18 documentation. To address the complex causes of physiological episodes, the NESC team used a multi-systems trends analysis approach and formed the following resulting findings. First and foremost, physiological episodes are a human phenomenon. Although the Navy has put a significant effort into investigating the physiological episodes, the bulk of their efforts to date have been directed at the aircraft rather than human physiology. Centering our investigation on the human element revealed new information about the character of physiological episodes. Second, hypoxia, determined to be the most prevalent cause of physiological episodes, is not a condition of insufficient oxygen in the breathing gas. It is insufficient delivery of oxygen to tissues of the body, body, importantly, the brain. Third, a key reliable onboard oxygen generator system performance is, is uniform operating conditions, which the F-18 design and dynamic operating environment rarely provides. Fourth, the F-18 program has a large amount of aircraft performance data, but a shortage of evidence related to human health and performance in an F-18 environment. Fifth, the F-18 systems that support human health are complex, dynamic, and interactive. This requires a well-coordinated systems approach to design requirements, interfaces, and operations. Finally, an unacceptable number of physiological episodes will persist in the F-18 program if there continues to be a piecemeal, piecemeal approach to the human systems integration. The NESC team made the following observations regarding the Navy processes. Until recently, the absence of a single leader to coordinate and prioritize the Navy's physiological episode efforts resulted in organizational stovepiping and the exclusion of key stakeholders. Investigations have been structured as if the physiological episodes were isolated events rather than a series of related events. Furthermore, troubleshooting efforts used a top-down approach that emphasized component-level behaviors instead of evaluating the performance of the system as a whole. In this case, the system means the aircraft, the pilot, and the environment. The NESC team asserts that a dedicated, coordinated, cross-organizational and cross-discipline program under the direction of a single leader with clear def defined authority would improve the U.S. Navy's effectiveness in finding and fixing the causes of physiological episodes. The NESC team has identified a number of near and long-term recommendations. Near-term tasks are focused on gathering key evidence about human health and performance and understanding hypoxia in the F-18 flight environment. Long-term tasks, which may provide substantial benefit, include utilizing a data-driven causal analysis effort, updating the F-18 to conform to MIL standard 3050, and developing a systems-level understanding of bleed air management systems. In conclusion, and although key data is lacking, the NESC believes the majority of F-18 physiological episodes are a result of hypoxia. This hypoxia, it is believed, is caused by a combination of issues affecting the various stages of oxygen delivery process, including those stages within the human. We applaud the Navy's efforts to gather the necessary data to resolve these issues. The NESC report has provided a conceptual framework to view the issue of physiological episodes in a new light and offers recommendations that may guide future processes and technological improvements. I thank you for the opportunity to testify before, you, before the subcommittee and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral Joyner. Mr. Chairman, Representative Songus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today 
to discuss the Department of the Navy's ongoing efforts to address physiological episodes, or PEs, in fighter and attack and training aircraft. Addressing PEs remains the Navy's number one safety priority and encompasses Naval and Marine Corps aviation communities. We have implemented numerous technical and operational measures to mitigate the risk to our aircrew. Utilizing every resource available to resolve these issues, the Department of the Navy has engaged a broad spectrum of internal and external partners, including subject matter experts from the United States Air Force, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, industry, academia, medical communities, and the Navy's dive communities. In addition, we've established regular fleet communication to share all data and progress related to PEs. I would like to first focus on the efforts of the Physiological Episodes Action Team, or PEAT. In April 2017, the Chief of Naval Operations directed a comprehensive review of PEs be conducted. As a result, the PEAT was formed to serve as a single source Navy and Marine Corps entity which unites both Department of Defense and non-DOD entities as a cohesive force to combat PEs. The PEAT follows three lines of effort, warn the aircrew, fix the machine, protect and prevent. Our efforts rely on understanding of inherently challenging environment encountered at altitude and its effects on the human body. The PEAT has served to synchronize efforts, efforts to resolve physiological episodes between NAVAIR, Commander Naval Air Forces, Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, the Naval Safety Center, our industry partners in academia. Coordinating multiple agencies, the PEATS focuses on finding the root causes of PEs, correcting deficiencies that they are identified, and equipping existing agencies with long-term resources to address PE issues effectively. Additionally, the PEAT is responsible for providing timely information to aircrew and maintainers regarding past PEs, present research, ongoing mitigation efforts, and future plans. Direct fleet engagement has been established where representatives from the PEAT, NAVAIR, and the Naval Safety Center are available for frank and direct dialogue with aircrew, providing open forum between warfighters and leadership. We provide a response triage reports to aircrew to improve feedback and communication. These efforts combined have made a great impact in restoring aircrew confidence in their equipment in the efforts to resolve the PE problem. Why haven't we solved the issue yet? Our incredibly talented engineers at NAVAIR have worked diligently to ensure the aircraft are operating according to required specifications and that material solutions met engineering requirements. As our aircraft capabilities have advanced, we have encountered challenges in how to best support the human in the cockpit in an ever more dynamic environment. Today, we benefit from oxygen systems that no longer limits prolonged operations, rather is limited only by the constraints of fuel, ordnance, and human endurance, routinely operating for eight hours or longer on a combat mission. By flying higher, faster, and longer, we have come to realize that there are aspects of our operational environment that need to be more fully understood. The NASA report was valuable in reminding us that we need to consider not just what we were most comfortable with addressing, the engineering elements, but also the human performance element of the aviation environment. The effects of pressure and breathing gas composition on the human body. It became apparent that in order to discover physiological episode root causes, we needed to start with the human, the aviator, and the cockpit. The close relationship between our aeromedical specialists and our engineers had atrophied, and we are working actively to restore this relationship in combating PEs. Today, we acknowledge that there is more we need to learn about human physiology in a pressurized environment and incorporate that into our engineering design. We are moving forward to close our knowledge gap through research and instrumentation on humans in flight and to develop a thorough and holistic understanding of environmental challenges in the flight regime that results in PEs. I would like to thank Congress for supporting the Navy's in our efforts to address PEs. We were able to combine congressional funding with other resources to immediately put into motion 
research and material solutions to address physiological episodes, as well as expedite longer term solutions. We are moving forward to in optimizing the cockpit environment with measurable improvements, providing our aviators with every tactical advantage in a dynamic environment in which they operate. It is appropriate that I appear today with our Air Force partners. Not present today are our international partners who continue to assist us in gathering data and providing solutions to the PE issue. Right now, the Royal Australian Air Force and the Swiss Air Force fly with instrumentation to gather further data in support of our efforts. I have no doubt that through our coordinated efforts, we will be successful in resolving this issue for the US Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and our international partners. Thank you for the opportunity to present our progress to date. I look forward to your questions. John Nolan. Chairman Turner, Ranking Member Songus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on our physiologic events within your United States Air Force. Today, I will address some of the risk our airmen face defending our nation, as well as multiple initiatives underway to address physiologic events. Operating high-performance aircraft is fundamental to air superiority. Inherently, the nature of our profession means there will always be risk to the human body. It can be caused by unforeseen mechanical issues in our increasingly complex aircraft, or, or by overstressing our bodies when we're max performing those aircraft to their combat capability. As the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, I believe that training our pilots is the critical factor between life and death. Whether it's executing the right procedures during in-flight emergency or the maneuvers necessary to defeat an adversary in combat, training is paramount. Therefore, therefore we make sure it goes hand in hand with material solutions when we implement recommendations for physiologic events. The Air Force tracks and provides historical data on physiological events. And even though the probability that Air Force pilots will experience a physiologic event remains less than, much less than 1% per, percent per year, the Air Force takes flight safety every, very serious. The service investigates every incident that may impact our most valuable asset, our people. And we are in complete agreement with actually the NASA report. This is really about people, as we have discovered over our incidents over time. The Air Force increased the budget of our 7-11th Human Performance Wing nearly by $60 million over the past 10 years, which goes back to the F-22 incidents we had, because we recognized we needed to look at the human element here. This funding has supported multiple research vectors into hypoxia, biomechanics, and toxicology studies. Additionally, the Air Force was able to add five pilot physicians last year. I have Dr. Uh, Bill Mueller behind me, who's an example of those. He's a rated Air Force pilot, but he's also a physician, so he flies the airplanes that were actually out there and able to talk to the aviators. This unique critical program qualifies aerospace physicians to fly the airplane and then care for their airmen. We've also made organizational changes to the headquarters Air Force operations staff. I have appointed a general officer to be the singular point of contact for physiologic events. We learn from the Navy, essentially. Brigadier General Bobby Dornboss will integrate the flow of information during physiologic event investigations. She couldn't be here today because she has a, something with her family, her father, but she's hand in hand with Admiral Joyner. General Dornbrost provides a single nexus to pass information from air crew to senior leaders and across multiple stakeholders. We continually see, continuously strive to improve our process as we share information between multiple agencies and our joint partners during these events. The Air Force stood up an investigative team called the Characterizing and Optimizing the Physiological Environment in Fighters. Typical, we have a five-letter name as opposed to the Navy's four. We call it COPE Fighter. This multiple service interagency team identifies solutions to optimize human performance and minimize unexplained physiologic events 
and our high-performance aircraft. But they're not always high-performance aircraft. So I'd like to provide a quick update on our T-6, which is our primary trainer, which is critical to the United States Air Force. The trainer fleet experienced multiple unexplained physiologic events since the beginning of 2018. The first one happened at Columbus on the 19th of January, and I happened to be there when that day that it happened was an extremely cold day. We took an operational pause last Friday after we had a, multiple events across the fleet to include Shepard and Vance, and if you remember, Vance had had previous events. We did it because we needed to think about the safety of our student pilots and the instructors. This pause will remain in effect until we are certain that aircraft and procedures ensure flight safety. Major General Patrick Doherty, the commander of the 19th Air Force in our Air Education and Training Command, and his wing leaders are actively meeting in person with T-6 instructors and student pilots to discuss the current situation and to listen to their concerns. We've learned this from our F-22 Raptor, our F-15, and our F-35. Direct interface with the leadership to the pilots is critical. But it's also critical that they meet with the spouses because we need to ensure the family members that we put safety first and to explain what actions we're undertaking to repair and return the fleet to flying status. The key is trust. If the air crew doesn't trust their system and the families doesn't trust the Air Force, we lose. That's why training is critical to this whole as we move forward. In our experience, we've studied the, the, the OBOGs, the onboard generating systems, and for the most part, we've not really discovered anything that's not working properly. We had some A-10 issues, which was a maintenance issue. We think we're discovering in the T-6, it's a maintenance issue right now. The system and the, and the, and the way the systems work is sound. Maintaining it is the critical factor. Your Air Force T-6s have flown 2.1 million hours with a physiological rate of 1.95. That means 1.95 incidents for every 100,000 hours flown. But in 2018, the rate is soaring. So what's going on? That's why we paused to look at it. But we also need to get in the training, and we totally agree with the Navy, I mean with the NASA, we need to instrument our, instrument our pilots. We're looking into that as we move forward. I thank you for the opportunity to provide you an update, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer any questions. General Nolan, I, I got to tell you, I, I could not be more disappointed by your presentation. I mean, we, we have had hearing after hearing after hearing on this, and we have this report in front of us, and the report and the presentation that we have is that the human factor is not being taken into consideration, and your answer is training. Now, I got to tell you, what I have in front of me, and I just had the Secretary of the Air Force in my office, and she does not agree with you, and I'm glad, because you didn't ground your, your, uh, uh, your aircraft, your T-6 aircraft, just last week because of training. I mean, th this is, this, this is a, a significant issue, and it, it's not just listen and talk. This is, this is pure safety. Now, when we first started having hearings on this, um, the issue that, that, um, that individuals who were testifying before us came forth with was the difficulty to replicate the, the conditions in which the physiological episode happened. No one ever came to us and tried to blame the pilots and say it's just an issue of, of training. There is something wrong with the systems that these pilots are relying on for their lives and that we're asking them to rely on. Now, I was just telling the secretary, and I mentioned this in the very first hearing that we had on this, I had this issue when I was a mayor, and it was with my firefighters and their breathing apparatus and equipment. And we, too, could not replicate anything that was happening with their equipment except a situation after a situation. They found themselves in where their breathing apparatus was failing. And it had an impact of morale on the entire fire department. And what, what I'm stunned by is that here I am in, I, I don't even know how many hearings we've had on this, and I still have, have someone who's, who's representing one of the most important service branches for our pilots come and say, this is an issue of training and listening, and we need to talk to we need to talk to spouses. I mean, I have this report in front of me, and one of the headlines on this report is no physiological monitoring of the pilot's breathing air has been conducted. This is an issue of talking. 
I mean, the Secretary of the Air Force is concerned that the T-6 training aircraft are grounded, not because somebody doesn't have training. Now, I realize what they've done in the past, but I realize what they're doing now. And I realize the problem that we had in the failure of the leadership in the Navy because, I mean, we had pilots that refused to fly because the leadership of the Navy continued to treat this as if it was not a physiological episode that was happening to people, but that it was something that, that because they were not able to replicate it, didn't need to be addressed. Now, we asked for this report and to, to move forward with this because we didn't feel like we were getting the right answers. But if you continue to come before us and say this is just an issue of training the pilots, I mean, you know, General, should, should we start doing hearing training where we ask you to come before us and then let's have you hold your breath for a minute to the first hearing and the second hearing we'll have you hold your breath for the second, uh, for two minutes, two seconds, or, or, or two minutes during the second hearing. It makes no sense. Mr. Craig, Give us some sense here. Now, the, the OBOG system has, has been tested. There's certainly concerns of maintenance. There's certainly concerns of, of where to identify this. But clearly, something is wrong for these number of pilots to have these incidences and these planes to be grounded versus just, we just have to train them to understand what to happen when the incidents happen. What should be happening to try to fix this so our planes fly again and people can get the training and our pilots have the confidence in their equipment? Well, sir, as we looked at, <clears throat> at the situation, um, we tried to come up with some hypotheses on what was causing uh, the problems with the, with the pilots. And we went through and looked, at least on the Navy side, we went through and looked at all the cases, and, and our flight surgeons came up with a consensus that over 80% of those cases were due to hypoxia. Then we looked at the uh, systems on board the uh, aircraft and they have what's called an OBOGS degrade light which comes on when the, when the uh, percentage of oxygen gets below a certain values. Uh, so what we did, we did a little further digging and, and found out that, that uh, many or most of the, the uh, physiological episodes that occurred happened without this OBOGS degrade light on. So in other words, they were getting proper, enough proper oxygen in the cockpit. Um, and so when we went to look further, what we found was there is hardly any information on, on the human uh, in the cockpit. We don't have uh, uh, the amount of oxygen in his mask, the amount of CO2 in his mask, the, the kind of pressure that you'd expect or you'd want to know about in the cockpit, uh, the breathing rates, uh, those kind of things where we could do some kind of physiological uh, assessment of, of what's happening to the pilot. Now, in our report, uh, you may have noticed we had a, a a, a, an oxygen um, diagram that, that showed how oxygen was, wh how we think oxygen is being taken away in little certain steps by, by different, uh, different circumstances, like an air crew vest that's, uh, that's too tight. Um, maybe, maybe they didn't have enough water there to drink before they fl uh, went on a flight, some things like that. So the, but what we, what we really need is to get a picture of the pilot, and we don't have that yet. Do you have any sense that this, that step is being taken? I mean, because as we try to do the data, pulling just off of these systems that are producing right. uh, the oxygen and being unable to replicate it, yeah. um, do you see any steps that, that, that are occurring to be able to get oh. that data of what the human is experiencing? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, I get a weekly summary from the Navy on what they're doing to uh, assist in the physiological episodes, and the one I got last end of last week They've, they've made some remarkable progress on getting those type of instruments in the cockpit that are going to measure just those things we talked about. And what is the data saying? Well, I, I, they, they, I, don't, I haven't seen the data, but what they, what they have is, is uh, they're out testing it with a VX23, I guess it is. So, I mean, it's a heck of a lot further on than it was when we delivered our report. Well, Admiral, what are you finding? So where we are today is we went to what was easy and T-45, we put in a system that could do cockpit pressure and oxygen delivered at the regulator outside of the OBOG system to the pilot because we could do that. And when we did that on the T-45, we had the discovery that we had a flow problem in that aircraft and that was able to give us that. But that was a, an easier solution than what we're pursuing right now. What he's speaking of is something called uh, an AMPS, it used to be called AMPS, now it's called Vigilox, which is an, a, an attempt to measure breathing gas at the pilot. 
And uh, we've tried several systems so far, and there are a lot of difficulties. It's probably one of the most difficult aspects of this problem, and we're working closely with the Air Force to do this, and we're leveraging a lot of their early findings in F-22. Uh, so we are, these systems come forward, they're not perfect, but we've flown three flights now with the Vigilox system. We're just starting to collect the data, and it's really early with the three flights. Right now, we don't see a lot of problems with I know you can't tell us anything that's conclusive, but are you at least being able to capture something that indicates that there is a problem? We are able to capture the information of what's being delivered at the pilot level. Right now, it will take those medical professionals and those researchers for us to better understand the data that's being delivered, because it's not apparent from the data that we're seeing what the shortfall would be. But we, it's three flights in, so it's very immature at this point. Uh, we're taking those steps. Those steps were, were brought forward uh, by the 7th, 11th Human Performance Wing, some of their early work with this system, and uh, through uh, NASA prompting and also the oxygen labs at NAVAIR. Uh, there's a lot of work to, to make these systems work and make the data actually speak to us. So speak to us about the F-35. Apparently, 29 physiological episodes have, have occurred. Uh, what can we learn from what you're doing now, and how does that apply to the F-35? I would say with the F-35, um, I talk to them constantly, uh, A through C. I'm sure the general also is uh, collecting that data as well. They, are, they enjoy an airframe that speaks to you more clearly than any other airframe we've ever had. So if I take my, my legacy Hornet, you're looking at my 78 Corvette. If I go to a Super Hornet, I'm looking at a, maybe a 2016 Lincoln Navigator. And if I'm in a JSF, I'm flying the newest and greatest, and it's telling us more data than we've ever had. So they are actually accelerating a lot of their learning, and they just finished testing their OBOX system, and they have a good understanding of that system, and it, it was a very positive outcome. But obviously, we have issues that we have to, to pull apart that are not we haven't discovered yet at this point. Ms. Songus. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk about the role of the medical community as you've wrestled with um, these very troubling episodes. And uh, I think one of the, obviously, the finding that we're all most taken by um, from the independent report is, is that this is so much about people. So I'm going to quote again from it just to sort of uh, restate that. So chapter 12 states the following, quote, PEs happen to people, not to aircraft. The U.S. Navy is addressing the PE problem as an aircraft problem, not a human problem. Remembering that PEs afflict people and not aircraft may help focus activities on better understanding human systems, human system requirements, and human system impacts caused by conditions of flight. Later, in Appendix A of the report, it goes further and says, quote, the naval medical community as a whole has not been involved with attempting to solve the PE issue. From the beginning, PEs have been viewed as an engineering issue, uh, and you've even referenced that, Adam, Ad Admiral Joyner. Therefore, a proactive investigative U.S. Navy medicine effort never really got underway, unquote. As an example of a lack of U.S. Navy medical involvement, the report points out that the decision to deploy hyperbaric chambers to treat altitude-induced altitude decompression illness appears to have been taken at the operational level. That is to say that it was made without any senior level medical involvement. So Mr. Craig, can you please elaborate on these statements in the report and what you and your team think should be done about it? Well, I, I think we were clear that the, the medical community need to, needed to get involved, and I'm happy to say that they currently are. Uh, one, one of the flight surgeons on my team participates with the, this meeting of, of naval medical people that, that is uh, just now getting underway to help support um, the, the uh, PE processes that Admiral Joyner has started. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's unfortunate, but when, when uh, everybody was saying this was a, an engineering problem, they weren't asked, and so they didn't participate. And were you surprised to find that? Yes, we were, we were actually very surprised to find that. And um, so now that we found, it, found this to be a real shortcoming, Admiral Joyner, these two findings and this particular example you know, are obviously quite troubling. 
and I think most members would assume that the Navy's medical communi community would be tightly integrated in all aspects of addressing the PE issue. Those of us here certainly would be. So what is the Navy currently planning to do uh, in this area of its overall PE response, and is, is there a plan going forward for U.S. Navy Medical to be involved in, in some way that we can depend upon? Yes, ma'am. Start part of the stand up of the PEAT was to bring in the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery underneath the PEAT in order to coordinate those efforts better. And uh, that's what having a single entity to try to bring this entire uh, fabric together has allowed us. So, what did we do? We set up something called the Aeromedical Scientific Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, and they are a group of professionals, both medical, academia, oxygen specialist, uh, our research scientists, some of the ones from Dayton, Ohio, uh, toxicology out of our NAMRU Dayton uh, group uh, that are dedicated to advising us as we move forward on the PE issue. Uh, we also have a, uh, an aeromedical team that uh, is immediately involved in all the responses on the flight lines and analyzing and making sure that we are coming up with clinical practice guidelines that are coherent and are tied in well with that research community and with our medical community. And then on top of that is we have the root cause corrective analysis team who has a, one of the members is a, uh, a operator who has become a flight surgeon, much like the uh, Air Force was talking about, General Nolan um, was talking about. And we have those professionals as well involved in the root cause analysis to make sure that we don't lose that human element as we go forward to try to find the root cause of the PE. Um, so those are several examples. Have you found uh, that by engaging the medical community in a more structured way, has it changed your clinical practice guidelines? So, for example, have you revisited the treatment you might, uh, the ways in which you dealt with hypoxia yeah. or, or dealt with decompression illness? I think it has standardized the response across the flight line, and it has energized further research in those areas that we are not as knowledgeable as we need to be for what the type of treatment should be. We also engage NASA, uh, has uh, been involved in several case reviews for us on some of the difficult issues of what the treatment should be. So we're extending beyond, even within our internal resources, to external resources like NASA. Uh, Duke uh, oxygen specialists and other people that we're bringing on board to better understand this problem. So I think it has increased the scope, it's increased our consistency with the cl clinical practice guidelines, and we know that the chambers themselves, it's a do no harm. They're, we know that they improve in conditions under those treatments, and we're not going to stop treating them effectively until we can find something better. But we have a full research community dedicated to finding out better ways to treat our aviators at this point. Thank you. I think you'll back. <laughs> They've called votes. Uh, I think we can get to Mr. Kelly, Mr. Langevin, and then we'll take a break. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. Uh, this is a very important issue. I, I, I think most of the people in here have uh, either soldiers, I mean, n n sailors or airmen that are affected, air, air people, air women. Uh, I have Columbus Air Force Base, and uh, General Nolan, Nolan uh, we, we just talked beforehand, and I know your son just graduated from there, so I know that you are personally vested in getting this right because you got skin in the game, and I think that applies to all of us who have served. I, I kind of agree. It's, it, there, there's multiple issues, and we haven't figured it out at any level, and we've got to figure this out, what's causing this, whether it's maintenance, whether it's lack of training, whether it's the improper use of equipment, whether it's the equipment itself. We, we've been going over this since a long time, but it's critical that we get it right and that we get it right quickly, but it's more important that we get it right. Um, what type of... I don't see any movement in finding the solution, and that's very, very difficult. So, I mean, you've got to start with seeing what those are. What things do you think, or is there any indication that we're getting close to finding at least what is causing, whether it's the maintenance of the system, which I heard you say, General Nolan, and I think that's important. If we don't maintain the system right and don't do that, then we get those episodes. Do either of you, uh, or, and, and this would uh, anybody on the board, or, do we have any idea what may be causing this? Um, Congressman Kelly, thank you very much. And 
uh, Chairman Turner and um, Ranking Member Songus and the distinguished members, if, if you got the impression from my testimony that we're blaming pilots, we're not. We are not. When I meant training, I'm talking holistic training exactly back to your part. Part of our suspicion with the T6 is that the time change technical order for the onboard oxygen generating system does not exist. We are formulating it right now. So we never trained our technicians on how to maintain that piece of equipment. What we found in the F-22s is the equipment that we had, the aircrew flight equipment, the life support equipment, we didn't have our crews trained properly to wear the equipment properly, and we noticed the valve on the chest was part of the solution. Back to the altitude chambers. We have 10 altitude chambers, but the altitude chamber that we did training 10 years ago or 20 years ago is different than what we do today. So it is a holistic view of all of it. So I think right now, our a suspicion is that the maintenance of our onboard oxygen generating system, our T6s, after having flown them for 2.1 million hours, needs to be repaired. So we believe there's a repair that, but we don't know that for sure. The human physiological episode, we absolutely believe, as I said with the um, NASA, that that we've got to collect data. We have ear cups data that we use in the F-35 that allows us to take the blood. One of the things that we found is when we have a physiological episode, we do not have the time quite right because the blood alkalinity changes. So we are putting testing equipment that will meet the air crew right at the airplane to try to get the, the best data that we can get from the pilots in the meantime. So to answer your question, sir, we're, we're working multiple solutions. We think it's maintenance on the T6 right now. One other quick question, and this is to both of you. Grounding of the T6 or the T45 or, or whatever equipment, we already have a pilot shortage across the board. What impact does this have on the training pipeline, and, and what are we doing to make sure that we don't have a prolonged impact, which gets uh, the, you know, the accordion effect as we go in time? Sir, General Doherty, the 19th Air Force commander, is working two solution sets. One is trying to get the onboard oxygen generating system to work properly. The second one is an interim solution where we would modify the crew 60, which is what we connect our oxygen mass to, take it off of the onboard generating system, use the ambient pressure, and then modify the flight profile so that we stay between six and 7,000 feet on cabin pressure. And then we would stop all solos. We would always fly our crews dual as we are working the simultaneous. We lose 700 sorties a day right now with the T6 grounding. That will have effect on our pilot training. For the T45, we have turned the curve. Our rate is maybe one-fifth of what it was uh, at the point where we were approaching the grounding, and that is a significant change. We, have, uh, we assess that we have identified the flow problem in the T-45 as being the primary issue. We've taken steps to mitigate it. We have long-term steps to solve it. For right now, though, that we have a training impact uh, that is be we're trying to absorb in all different phases of flight through our follow-on training. We're bringing the reserves to bear against the training problem. We're extending the resources of the contract support that we have on the T-45, and we're trying to buffer that impact across the system, longer term relying on some of our aviators to operate longer on a volunteer basis at sea in order to try to, to uh, blend this across the system. But there are impacts, and if it, 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 you can't deny those, we're just trying to mitigate them at this point. Thank you, Chairman. My time's expired. Thank you. Um, before I get to Mr. Langevin, uh, General, thank you for clarifying that. This is our fifth hearing and briefing on this. We just sort of expect a progression of shared values on issues, and I appreciate your clarifying your language because when we began this, um, as Mr. Craig has said, it's not just the human value, the pilot value was not being honored. I appreciate you making that clarification statement because there, there is at times when you have something like this, the question of is it real, and this committee certainly believes that what's occurring is real. Mr. Langevin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. It's a very important issue that we need to get to the bottom of. Uh, I haven't heard a whole lot that makes uh, clear sense of all this yet, except for some of the information I have before me right now. So I'll, uh, I'll put this out there and uh, then ask the uh, 
uh, Mr. Craig to respond first, but uh, the NASA review report states on page 15 that, quote, uh, a, a problem with the breathing gas system as a whole is that the onboard oxygen generation system gets fed last. The enormous amount of cooling air required for the avionics and radars, especially on the E-8 18G growlers, means that the ECS controls preferentially directs flow to them instead of uh, the OBOGs. Then finding 10-7 uh, of the report states that, and I quote, avionics flow has priority over cabin flow in some operational cases. Data from the PE flights has directly demonstrated cases in which high avionics flow results in lower than required cabin airflow. Finally, observation 10-2 in the report states that, and I quote, the Navy appears to have little insight into elements of the ECS control programming logic. Discussions with engineering teams at the Patuxent River and uh, fleet support uh, activity North Island suggest that the logic uh, programming control sets were not part of the uh, contract deliverable for the F-18 and uh, therefore may no longer be documented in any form. So if I had to summarize these report, these, state, these three statements, uh, it would be that the crew's airflow comes last. But the Navy doesn't seem to know exactly why that's the case. So given the aircraft can't operate without its crew, one would think that the opposite would be true. So Mr. Craig, uh, to you, would you agree with the overall assessment? And what else would you like to add uh, what's in the report on this subject? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, I would agree with that statement. Um, the Navy does not fully understand the pressure control logic because, as you mentioned, uh, it wasn't part of the uh, F-18 design that was supplied to the Navy by Boeing. Um, but this somewhat gets to the theme, one of the themes of our report, that we think the Navy needs to do some human system integration where they look at all aspects uh, of what's going on with the human, what's going on with the environment, and how the, the system it, of the airplane itself operates. And if they don't have a, an idea of how the, the logic control portion of, the, of a key component, the environmental control system, that's, that's a deficiency. Um, and and they need to do that. They need to figure out um, how that operates. So, you know, one, they can troubleshoot the system properly, but at, at, the, at the other side, they need to do this human system integration where they put everything together and understanding exactly how your systems operate is key to that. Uh, Admiral Joyner, uh, the, uh, I also have several questions for the Navy following the statements in the report. First of all, what can be done to fix this? Does the Navy have uh, uh, all the technical data on the F-18 to address this issue? And if airflow to the crew was given first priority on the aircraft, how would that affect mission systems? And then finally, does the Navy have a, a, an effort in place with Boeing to address this design issue in, in the current uh, and new F-18s? I would say uh, I vary in my opinion and my sta status on the ECS system. The OBOX is the primary system that's fed and uh, cooling air is not removed from the OBOX system in order to feed it elsewhere. There are instances where if the avionics are overheating that it won't pull it from the OBOX, it will pull it from the cooling for the pilot in order to make sure the avionics function. None of us want our avionics to shut down because it will result in an ejection, and that's not something we want to seek. So overall, I would say that when I look at the ECS system on the F-18, we need to regulate it better. That's where our emphasis has been. Um, due to the, uh, the timing of the legacy system and the F-18, a lot of what is available on the ECS system is uh, analog. It's in vaults and it's stored elsewhere. We have access to those, but it's not as simple as looking it up on a system. You have to go find that. And we're working directly with Boeing to make sure we have access to all the support material we need. The engineers at Navair reassure me and we have walked me through the system to explain to me why they know that the pressure system and how they've tested it. But we realize we want to test it further on the OBOG system, and we're taking advantage of the 7th 11th uh, lab that they have that they are able to do dynamic testing that recreates the flow that's given to that system in the OBOG. So, so we're going to take advantage of that testing as well to do dynamic testing, not just point testing. Did, did I understand you, though, that you, you completely disagree with NASA's findings that that the uh, that the the airflow the OBOX system is fed last. 
my understanding of the system is that OBOGS is prioritized first, ECS is second. The third system that it goes is the avionics cooling, except if it starts to compromise those avionics systems. And then we're going to pull heat but not pressure out of the system. The, the F-18 has a lot of pressure. And it's from what I see today, it is more about regulating that pressure because we are causing overpressurization at times within that system. And that is an issue that we have to, we're putting in eight corrections to the ECS system in order to try to regulate that pressure better and try to smooth the flow. So we realize that our concentrator, our OBOG system, could have a better system, uh, and we're pursuing that, but we don't necessarily agree that the, the how it's prioritized is done incorrectly. We're gonna have to take a recess. We do have votes we have to run to, and I know Mr. Gates uh, has, has questions, and we're returning for those.
Okay. Call the hearing back to order. Please have a seat. That's Mr. Gallego and Mr. Carbajal. Mr. Gallego, your questions, please. Excellent, thank you. Uh, my question is about the GGU-12 onboard oxygen generation system and on our F-18s. At three separate points in the report, NASA advises us of testing and practices for the critical system that seem abnormal. First, the report states that the Navy and Boeing have not followed well-known industry best practices in a system that is critical to the life support of, of our F-18 air crews. Further, it appears that current Test equipment does not simulate real flight conditions actually encountered by the F-18s. So if that is true, it could generate false positive results, as we're hearing from now, that may conceal underlying problems with the system as it operates under real conditions. And third, it appears that some of the underlying design specifications for the F-18's oxygen generation system are decades, decades out of date and do not reflect the latest scientific knowledge on air crew breathing demands. One of the report's key recommendations to bring these specifications up to date to conform to standards developed in 2015. Ms. Quash, Mr. Craig, Craig, apologize. Taken together, these examples from the report indicate that the breathing system, the F-18, has serious problems. Do you agree? Yes, sir. And how would you summarize what these problems are? Well, I would say, unfortunately, the original OBOG specifications were not put through the human systems integration process that would have highlighted the fact that it cannot deliver for all conditions, like high stress portions of the flight. Uh, that is why a key recommendation of our report is to re-examine the OBOGs in light of the human system integration effort. Uh, and additionally, as you pointed out, uh, some of the testing that's done on the OBOGs doesn't uh, you utilize uh, in-flight conditions, but I, I understand that they're getting better and closer to the real thing. And, and <laughs> they're getting better and closer to the real thing. Is there a time period we understand that this is going to be happening? Uh, I think you ought to ask the Navy that, sir. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Nolan, while you're not in the Navy, while you're not Navy, do you have anything to add to what Mr. Craig's answer? Uh, on the F-18, uh, no, sir, I do not. I think many of us are a little anxious to see some form of conclusion or time period, and especially when we're involving the lives of our service members. Uh, I yield back. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Yep. Mr. Carvajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for uh, your service and for addressing us today. Uh, the report makes two statements regarding leadership and communications within the naval aviation community that I want to touch on. First, in finding 10 through 29, it states that, quote, there has been a breakdown of trust in leadership within the pilot community, and that one notable area leading to a lack of trust in leadership is the completion of parts A, B, C of the physiological episode report. Once these questionnaires are completed, they disappear through the system only to be examined months later. None of the pilots interviewed ever received official word as to the cause of the incident or the mitigation the U.S. Navy would be taking to reduce the likelihood of a repeated event. Second, with regard to feedback from aviators, the report, observation 10 through 20, points out that, quote, the Navy has not conducted a fleet-wide survey of their FA-18 air crew to understand the PE problem from the human perspective, where these events actually occur. Taken together, it appears that the communication issue noted in the Navy's own comprehensive review conducted earlier this year remains a problem. Rear Admiral Joyner, what is the Navy doing to get feedback on PE event investigations back to the crew members that experience them. Yes, sir. What we do right now is we have a quick look that we're doing. We started in T-45s where we try to come back at the 48-hour point and we brief out our quick look response of what we're receiving from the parts A, B, and C and information that we receive from the aircraft itself. And we present that to the air crew. Approximately 30 days later, we come back with a full report uh, which outlines what we found on the aircraft 
as far as any system failures, any additional information we were able to derive from the data sets. So in F18, we're using slam stick data, which regulate, uh, tests the pressure inside the cockpit. We're getting the OBOGS information for any type of malfunctions we're able to find. We also have a quick response force that falls in on the aircraft. And rather than breaking the system as we have historically, we holistically analyze the system with a team on station that includes a medical professionals, it includes uh, engineers, uh, a Boeing rep is also on board, and the pilots are also involved with the pilot maintenance and the aviation physiology, the uh, aeromedical safety officer, all fall in on the aircraft to do this analysis and, and try to figure out root cause for each of the events. That's all communicated back to the pilots. Part of that communication plan is also what we call the PE Roadshow, which is uh, just returned from Japan doing one out there for both at Sugi and Iwakuni, and we address the pilots directly on what we're finding with their aircraft, different trends. We're getting a health monitoring system up online that basically shows the prognostic health of their airframes by Buno, and we're showing them on their aircraft what we're seeing with the data. So the feedback loop has been strengthened and we're making sure that we're getting that back down to the deck plates to the aviators uh, by, site by site. The second part is the survey. We just completed the survey last Friday. We did uh, get over 500 responses um, out of our aviation community, but we also did maintainers as well. It was a large response. Uh, we got about 22% of aviators and maintainers responded to the survey. And that survey is uh, designed to go ahead and solicit that feedback and get information about different things that have impacted the pilots and how they're operating. So we did take both of those on board and we did move forward on them quite regularly. And then we also have the weekly newsletters and engagements that we do with the fleet. I go site to site. And was this done, this survey of the FA-18 community as well? Yes, sir. That was F-18 and T-45. Great. May I ask how long this feedback loop has been in uh, place? The T-45 feedback loop has been in place for roughly, I think, three months. We, when we stood up and went back to flying uh, back in uh, September time frame, we realized that we needed to push that information down. And so in September, uh, the T-45 led the way. And now we brought that on board with F-18, and we started that roughly November, December time frame. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Padetta. Ms. Zongas. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry for the break, but appreciate your patience. Um, Admiral Joyner, I just have a, com a couple of quick questions that really only take a yes or no answer, or maybe if it's not clear that it's one or the other. Um, the report states in finding 1020 that there's been no definable effort to use the OBOGS laboratory at the 7-Eleven's wing at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to assess effects on OBOGS output gas. Is there currently a, a, a plan in place to conduct this testing? I was going to ask that, but I felt like I had a conflict, so thank you for asking that. I did not ask <laughs> her to ask that, but that, that's important. That is in the report, and that is a question. Yes, ma'am. We are intending to use the 7th, 11th uh, dynamic testing lab that they have on site. It's an important resource, and it's a shame it took this study to lead to that. Um, does the Navy intend to issue a request for proposal in the near future for a new onboard oxygen generation system for the FA-18? Yes, ma'am. Does the Navy intend to develop and install a new cabin uh, air pressure monitoring and alerting system for the FA-18? Yes, ma'am. Does the Navy intend to design and replace the F-18's cabin pressure regulator valves? Yes, ma'am. Is the Navy uh, doing up? We are looking into a suitable replacement for that. We've gone through to repair them and to make sure that the maintenance when they come back out to the fleet is accurate. We are looking at a couple of different options for that valve, but right now we have concerns about some of the solutions we've been offered. So I wanted to clarify that. Okay. Is the Navy doing upgrades to the ECS software on FA-18s and EA-18Gs to deal with icing in the ECS-related water lines? Yes, ma'am. And is the Navy planning to install an automatic backup oxygen system in the T-45? Yes, ma'am. Is, is it planning to do so for F-18s? It is not at this time. Thank you. Admiral, <clears throat> help us. Um, we've had a total of five now hearings and briefings. 
Ms. Angus and I both traveled to you um, and have received briefings on this. Um, we asked for this report. Mr. Craig, thank you so much for the, the detailed information that's in this. I mean, this is very, very helpful of, unfortunately, things that aren't happening after things that aren't happening are things that aren't happening. Th this has got to be fixed. This has got to stop. Um, and and I, I, don't, I, I don't have confidence that we're getting nearer to that. I, I believe that there is a number of, there are a number of things that are being done, the number of things that are not being done that are now being done because the report said to do them. But um, this would seem to me to be something that needs to be done quickly and, and expeditiously, and that this should not be a research project. This should be a fix-it project. Help me get some sense that, that we're, we have in place things that are going to do that, knowing that this started with our having an understanding that pilots had to revolt and say, I won't fly because the chain of command wasn't even recognizing their, uh, their complaints and their incidences, you know, all the way to there, there's still a, a sense of morale of lives are at risk. Help us get a sense that the work that we're doing and the work that you're doing is gonna result in something. Right now, T-45s are fully operational. They operate every day. We have over 27,000 flight hours. We have had six events in those aircraft, all mild in nature, one of which was a system failure that was identified by the system. So we have turned the corner on T-45. We have long-term corrections in place, design changes to the aircraft to fully address it. So we're not declaring victory. We have an RCCA, a root cause corrective analysis team that goes line by line, starting with the human, ending with the human, trying to find root cause for both the T-45 and the F-18. Industry is involved, aeromedical is involved, NASA it helps consult and keep us on track so that we don't lose sight of things that may be falling out. We have a long-term goal of adding and a robust human systems integration effort on par with our aircraft design requirements and engineering force. So we are looking to fully integrate them within our efforts. On F-18, we're, we're turning the corner. We see now that we are able to influence the pressure response on the aircraft. We've been able to make noticeable and observable, measurable changes to the F-18, which are resulting in a better, stable, more stable ECS system. There's long-term design changes in place to ensure that we further stabilize that system, and we have a, a uh, OBOX concentrator that we're looking for the request for proposal. We are open to added things that are found along the way in order to, to make sure that we're not missing anything. That root cause effort is the longer-term effort that'll lead us. The, the medical force outcomes will take more time. That Those are fully funded. Uh, through the fit up type of efforts to fully define pressure and oxygen requirements for pilots. We're working with the Air Force actively and we're pursuing all those answers long term. I, I, I don't, every day I ask myself, what else could we be doing that we're not doing? I turn to NASA and I ask those questions. I work with the Air Force and we make sure in academia as well. And we want to make sure that we are not missing a single thing. And we've gotten your assistance as well, which is helping us do those efforts. So I can, I, all I can tell you is this, my effort doesn't stop. I will have somebody who will relieve me in this effort and we won't stop until we resolve it. Um, well, I want to thank Mr. Craig for the, the, this very important study that I think has helped create a path forward. And I appreciate uh, Admiral Joyner, the seriousness of purpose you've brought to this effort. Again, as I said in my opening remarks, I'm very concerned that you're being rotated out in, in less than a year into this effort and uh, remain very hopeful that somebody will be, be put in your place who can stick with it a little longer because we know change does uh, lead to setbacks, and uh, we can't afford to lose any more time. And just wanted to th say as we're here, as we sit here today, uh, new FA-18s are rolling off the production line at a cost of about $69 million per aircraft. At some point, paying $69 million for an aircraft we know has serious problems with its life support system has to be questioned. 
So I'm not calling for stopping production, but it seems clear that the Navy and Boeing need to work together and come up with improvements to the F-A-18 that make them safer for our brave men and women in the military to operate because we know it puts their lives at risk and to make sure every single new F-A-18 has those improvements built in from day one and we're not back here a um, no good number of years hence revisiting these same problems yet again. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Um, many times this committee authorizes a request, a report to be done. I, you and NASA have done yourselves. This was a phenomenal and excellent report. Uh, it's great to see that work product uh, translated from, from our request. And, and thank you for the, the dedication at which you approach this. Appreciate uh, all of your efforts for this. I hope as we get to our, what will have to be a sixth uh, hearing um, and, and or briefing on this uh, that we have um, a greater sense, uh, although Admiral, I appreciated your closing comments of things that you are accomplishing, a greater sense uh, that, that this is um, being advanced in a way that um, hopefully the committee can, f can feel as if it's being done in a way that our oversight is no longer necessary. And these can be just incidences that go into reports instead of incidences that in the aggregate require congressional action. Thanks, that will adjourn.